Well, there was an animal trainer who used to work with a 10-foot python snake. And this particular animal trainer put on performances uh, with this uh, snake in the sideshow of a circus. And when this uh, trainer gave a signal, the python wrapped itself around the trainer slowly from head to toe. In that way, the animal trainer would be temporarily disabled. He would be immobile, but he would be unharmed. Uh, well, one particular day, this uh, python followed the signal as usual. But after a number of successful stunts, the audience heard a pained scream. It was coming from within the coil of the snake itself. With a snapping sound, the snake systematically uh, was choking the life out of this animal trainer, breaking every bone in his body. The audience was hearing this. The audience could actually hear what this animal trainer was, was going uh, through, and it was blowing them away as this animal trainer's bones were being crushed uh, systematically. They were able to shoot the python snake, but it was really too late for the animal trainer. Can you imagine what a terrible way to go? What a horrific way to die. Hey, I don't know about you, but I really resonate with Indiana Jones. I hate snakes. You know, that snake is like sin in our lives. Think about it. When it comes to, to sin, we, we tell ourselves this narrative. We say to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to be all right. It's going to be okay. I wasn't harmed the last time I got involved in that thing. And so we allow sin to wrap its coils around us with no apparent injury whatsoever. And we think that we are going to be just fine. But then it happens. It's too late. Sin crushes us, just as that snake crushed that animal trainer. And I'm here to tell you that that's true regardless of your age. It's regardless of your background. It's, it's true regardless of your uh, commitment to the Lord. If we entertain sin in our lives, it's going to squeeze us. It's going to, to have a crushing effect upon our lives. You see, we can never get around the fact that sin has a crushing impact upon our relationship with the Lord. Our relationship with God gets hurt. It gets wounded at the point when we defy God, when we disobey his word, and we are in defiance, disobedience to God himself. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that uh, it will cause you to lose your salvation, nor am I suggesting that you will automatically become an object of God's wrath. If we are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we really do belong to him, then based on the promise of God's word, God will never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. But still... Sin can injure our relationship with God. It can have a detrimental, uh, harmful, injurious impact upon our rapport with the Lord. Just by way of background, you know as well as I do that throughout the scripture, uh, sin has had a crushing impact upon the lives of people. I mean, you need to go way back. We were studying this uh, very principle in our Bible study this last week. If you go way back uh, to the very beginning, sin had a crushing impact upon Adam himself. After Adam sinned, not only was he separated from the tree of life and from the garden, but he became separated from God himself. 
Now let me just get a little theological with you for just a few moments. As our spiritual representative, as our federal head, as the ancient theologians used to say, when Adam sinned in the garden, this was not a standalone event for him. All of his descendants, with the exception of Jesus Christ himself, inherited a sin nature as a result of what took place with Adam in the beginning, in the garden, uh, we all were born with original sin. And you could go throughout the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament itself, and you can find the crushing impact of sin upon one person after another. It's cataloged throughout the scriptures. How Sin has this damaging, painful impact upon people. And then when we come to the New Testament, we find a similar narrative. And you find people who, in some cases, love the Lord even, who are crushed by sin and how it wounds them, it, it hurts them. Think back with me with the Apostle Peter. We know from reading uh, the Gospel accounts that, that, that good old Pete denies Jesus three times. And as a result of that, he was bummed. He, he felt great pain in his heart because he rejected the master. Consequently, he needed to be restored back to Jesus. He wept bitterly because of the pain of, of actually denying the Lord who he loves. And yet he did get restored. And we are told in the word of God that uh, Jesus actually challenged him and said to him three times, do you love me? Uh, Peter, Peter do, do, do you love me? Are you sure about that now? And so he keeps getting up in Peter's face because Peter had demonstrated through his denials that he wasn't demonstrating love toward the Lord. And that had this crushing impact, like that snake squeezing the joy out of a Peter. During Jesus' earthly ministry, we find that he continually is, is warning people about the crushing impact that sin can have upon their lives. Over and over and over again, he will call out people and, and say to them, Beware! Watch out! And so he, at least on one occasion warn the people of his day that those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, get this, will never be forgiven. If a person is blaspheming, blaspheming the Spirit of the living God, that individual, according to Jesus, will never know God's peace in his or her life. That person will never have a clear conscience. And upon that individual's demise, when that person dies, that person will not have a second chance. The scripture will make it uh, clear to that individual, not only is there no second chance, but that person will not be put out of existence. Annihilation will not occur. Upon that person's death, that individual will be cast into the lake of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you look through the lens of the crushing impact that sin has upon people, you would have difficulty going through many pages of the scripture which, without seeing how people are negatively impacted by sin. Now, as we return once again to Psalm 51, uh, but we locate uh, a man who certainly experienced the crushing impact of sin upon his life. Of course, his name is David. David is the human author of Psalm 51. And he was being systematically squeezed by sin in his life. And part of the spiritual nugget that David shares with us uh, from his own personal prayer closet, his personal confession, is tucked away in Psalm 51. And there in Psalm 51, 
uh, David that says, Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you judge and blameless. He makes that abundantly clear. So what we're going to discover from this text are two valuable lessons, really important lessons that will help us the next time that we are filling in the dregs of our sin, when we are feeling systematically crushed by some iniquity in our lives, whether that be in thought, word, or deed, that will be abundantly clear to us. And if right now you find yourself being crushed, systematically squeezed, the big hurt is being put on you because of sin in your life, you're going to need what we're going to be looking at today. We are going to discover these uh, two important lessons, one of them being that um, sin is a violation that's directed against God. God himself ultimately is the one that we sin against, not people. We'll talk about that a little bit further. And once we observe that, we are then going to observe how sin is a violation that moves God's hand in judgment. So let's go ahead and, if you're taking notes, let's look at that first lesson together, and that is uh, sin is a violation that is directed against God. In essence, what we could say is that sin is an affront. It is an assault against God. It impugns God's character, and it drags his name through the mud. You see, when you and I sin, it's not like we are sinning uh, all by ourselves in a corner. Uh, we are dragging God's name through the mud as his representatives. People are thinking to themselves, oh, is that how you Christians live? Is that what it's really like to be a Christian? Hey, count me in. I could just come with all my sinful baggage and, and be the same as, as you are. And so we need to take sin seriously in our lives, recognizing that it's hurtful. It pains the heart of God. Now we find that second person pronoun you in this verse. You, which is, of course, a reference to our thrice holy God. We need to remember that God, in fact, is so incredibly holy, he can't even look upon sin. Is that not what the prophet Habakkuk communicates in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, where Habakkuk writes, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. God is so holy, he can't even glance upon sin itself. No doubt that is why when Jesus died on the cross and darkness covered the land, this lack of intimacy between Jesus and the Father was as such that the intimacy was not there anymore for Jesus and he did not refer to God as his father at that moment. Rather, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it could very well be, theologians will discuss this, that God was turning away his face from observing how, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him, God made his son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. God could not even look upon what his son was experiencing because that is how holy the Father is. That's how holy the Godhead is. Basically, the psalmist here is saying, all of my wrongdoings, whatever wrong I've done, are culminated at your divine throne. Ultimately, not against these people. It's against you, God. Just because a person expresses the fact that he or she has sinned uh, does not necessarily mean that person recognizes that they have sinned against God. Did you know that there are lots of people in the scripture who admitted to the fact that they sinned, but not against God? They saw the wrongdoing, they owned it, 
but they didn't see how there was something in the spiritual arena that was being impacted. There are times when individuals uh, such as Pharaoh and Abimelech and Balaam and Saul and Shemai and Judas all said, I have sinned. These are unbelievers who acknowledge, hey, I, I blew it. Genesis chapter 20, verse 9, Exodus 9, verse 27, Numbers 22, verse 34, 1 Samuel 16, verse 21, 2 Samuel 19, verse 20, Matthew 27, verse 4. So there is ample biblical substantiation for the fact that there are people who acknowledge that they sinned against God, that they did something that was wrong, but they didn't come to the place of saying, I have sinned against you. You only, God. There's a, a good New Testament example of an individual who came clean, not only about his sin, but recognized that his sin was against God himself. And this uh, individual who I have in mind is the prodigal son. So this dude, he gets his dad's inheritance and and he, he blows it, he spends it all on, on a wild life, wine, women, and song. And he's just given himself over to complete worldliness. He's living in a pigsty existence. He, he comes to his senses, he, he recognizes that he, is, he has sinned. And he meets up with his father and he says to his father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And so the prodigal son recognizes that as much as he may have hurt his own father, that his sin was against heaven's champion, God himself. Now you say, wouldn't it have been more accurate if uh, David uh, said against Bathsheba, against Uriah, I have sinned? I mean, I think a lot of us would, would say, hey, those were the people he wounded. Those were the people he hurt. And is it true that, that David severely wronged those individuals? At the same time, we need to recognize that David sinned against God because at that point in his life, he was despising God's authority over his life. He was usurping the leadership, the lordship, of the sovereign God of the universe, the God of holy writ, and he was defying God himself. When God spoke through Nathan the prophet uh, to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 9 and 10, the Lord linked David's sin to despising God and his word. Nathan says to David, in 2 Samuel 12, 9 and 10, Why have you despised the word of the Lord and by doing evil in his sight? A paraphrase known as the message words it like this. So why have you treated the word of God with brazen contempt? The New American Standard Bible goes on to read, You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the son shall never depart from your house because you have, here it is, despised me. David, you despised the word of God. David, you despised God himself. It wasn't just that you put the big hurt on Bathsheba and Uriah. And so, the text says, Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Yes, David brought great harm upon Bathsheba, upon Uriah, no question whatsoever about that. But David's great sin was despising God and breaking his law. Sometimes we are just horizontal when it comes to how we process how our lives impact people and how our sin affects them. In reality, when you and I sin, we are raising a clenched, raised fist against the lover of our soul, the one who made us, 
the one who loves us, the one who gave his son that we might have a relationship with him. We are, in fact, despising God at that moment. We are despising the word of God. This is not some minor transgression, some peccadillo. It's not some, some little hurtful thing that we've did. We have communicated to God at that moment, I hate you. Is that strong enough? Should that jar us enough away from even thinking about going in a certain direction of sin in our lives? Yes, David violated two of the Ten Commandments from the Decalogue. We know that he violated the Sixth Commandment, you shall not murder, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. He also violated the Seventh Commandment, you shall not commit adultery, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. But the fact that David's sins were violations that were only directed against God can be seen in his unique position as a king. So let's take ourselves out of the equation for a moment and realize what David is getting across based on the fact that he was the big kahuna. He was the man in Israel. He was the king of Israel. David answered to nobody on a human level, and David didn't have to be accountable. He could do whatever he wanted to. He was the king. Prince, well, King Charles, I called him Prince Charles, but King Charles was just uh, coronated. And I, I, I noticed the picture of him with that, that rather impressive crown uh, that he, he has now. I, I don't know uh, if he walks around throughout the day with that thing that looks rather heavy, but uh, he is the ultimate monarch at the moment uh, in, in, in Great Britain. And you've got to wonder, who does he really think he has to answer to? That was King David's situation. David's all, hey, I'm the man. I'm the guy. I don't answer really to anybody. There's no human superior uh, to David at this point. And since God alone was above David in his kingdom, it was only to God that David was responsible. He was above accountability. And so when David says, against you, you only I have sinned, he recognizes there's someone even above him that he has to give an account when you and I sin, it's not just that we are hurting ourselves. We're not just hurting our mate. We're not just hurting one of our children or grandchildren. It's not just that we are, are hurting maybe one of our, our parents or someone here at church or in the community. When you and I sin, ultimately our sin is against God. And we could have a whole message on how God observes every detail of our thoughts, of our speech, of our actions. So while other people may think, ah, you're being too hard on yourself. No, we answer ultimately to God, who observes everything in our lives. And what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Therefore, you are to be mediocre, mediocre and average. No, he says you are to be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. We can't be perfect in and of ourselves, but at least we need to acknowledge our imperfection and our, our ability to be sinful and express our dependency upon the Lord to follow him, this infinitely holy God. Well, having seen the fact that sin is a violation that's directly against God, let's now segue to our second uh, lesson for today from this passage. And that is, uh, sin is a violation that moves ha God's hand in judgment. That's the second lesson. Sin is the cause that comes from uh, us. Judgment is the effect that comes from God. David knew that God would entirely be fair if God 
decided to take David out to snuff out his life. David recognized that if God were to do that, there would be no blame on God. In fact, he would be doing the right thing because David deserved to die because of his adultery. He deserved to die because of being a murderer. That's why David says in verse 4, you are ju justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. You're off the hook, God. You're not to blame if you decide to, with swift judgment, boost me into eternity right now at this very moment. In, in, in case you think uh, we're being a little bit harsh here, the judgment or the disciplinary action of God uh, to bring on death being completely justified is supported in the scripture, that that was the appropriate consequence for adultery. That was the appropriate consequence for murder. Uh, this was based on a teaching that's found in the Torah, also known as what? first five books of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch. So in the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, we are told in Leviticus 22, verse 10, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. There it is. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 22 similarly reads, If a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. In addition to David deserving to die because of his adultery with Bathsheba, he also deserved to die on account of his uh, murderous plot uh, of her husband Uriah. This is pr the prescribed measure that goes all the way back to Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. See, people are image bearers. And while we may be so tempted to give ourselves over to a vigilante way of dealing with situations where we choose to take a person out, God says, no, no, there are proper ways of dealing with justice. It's not for you to go all Rambo on an individual uh, and just destroy their life. You can't do it. Even though David was not personally the one who shed Uriah's blood, he was directly and exclusively responsible for Uriah's death. He was culpable. He was the one behind this murderous plot to have Uriah killed. And the consequence of such actions are spelled out in Leviticus 24, verse 17. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. Once again, David knew that if God's hand of judgment was going to be unleashed upon David, David would get exactly what is coming to him. God would be justified in taking David's life, and God would be rendered innocent, blameless, be able to go scot-free with doing nothing wrong if God killed David on the spot. But that is not what took place. God was merciful. He was compassionate, gracious to David. Even though David couldn't defend his case against God's divine justice, no doubt David remembered what he penned in Psalm 9, verse 8. He, that is God, will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. And though David deserved to die, though that is exactly what he had coming to him because of his adultery and murder, God was merciful in sparing his life. Sometimes we, we, we try to take justice into our own hands. And we think that if we can just vote the right person in, we're going to go back to the 1950s. It's going to be leave it to beaver time. Father knows best. 
It'll be like Mayberry RFD if we just can see to it that our political orientation, our bent, who we want to vote for, gets in. We need to take a serious chill pill as Americans and recognize that God is the righteous judge over all the earth and all individuals and nations will account to him one day. I'm not saying that we shouldn't get out there and vote. I'm not saying that we should not have uh, various politicians uh, who represent God's word as best as possible be voted in and supported and encouraged and prayed for. What I am saying is that justice on this side of eternity will not be perfectly meted out because we live in a sinful, fallen world that has lost its way and it will not be able to find its way back on track on its own. So our trust, once again, needs to be anchored in the Lord himself. We know that even though God was gracious and merciful to David, God still made life miserable for David. Don't forget that the child that came into the world through David and Bathsheba died. That brought an enormous amount of heartache. And there was constant turmoil that David had to face as the king over the nation. He had infighting and dysfunctionality on steroids within his family. I mean, there was all sorts of havoc being wreaked with, with his kids. Even Absalom, his own son, was going after him, wanted to take out his dad. So we are talking about hardcore family fallout that took place because of David's sin. If there is a message that we need to have drilled into our minds that we don't forget, it simply is this. The truth of the matter is, when it comes to sin, you and I cannot handle it. Sin is stronger than we think. It has a very powerful narcotic effect upon the soul. A damaging effect. And even if you were not harmed before by a certain sin in your life, don't let it slowly wrap itself around you and squeeze out your life like that snake did to that animal trainer. It's easy to allow it to happen. At one point in the animal trainer's mind, he's thinking, oh, we've done this so many times. I've had this, this python wrapping around me. We've done this. It was successful. But there was a certain point of no return. It was too late. And the animal trainer's life was snuffed out of him. Our society mocks at sin. Our society thinks sin is a joke, that you're a joke that your puritanical, old-fashioned, obsolete, antiquated values are a big part of the problem. And that you are adhering to a dangerous book that should be burned and never brought out again. This passage drills deeply into our spirit the importance of recognizing that we need to take sin seriously. And that sin wreaks its, its damage, great damage, upon our lives when we allow it to even be entertained, even in our thoughts. We don't want to be injured. You, again, you may be thinking, ah, I, you know, I, I'm playing with sin. Um, like uh, perhaps Eve, who took the fruit and got a little bit of the skin of the fruit under her fingernail, Besides, she decided to take a bite. Maybe there's a little bit of sinful fruit under your skin right now, and you're toying with it. The goal is not to see how close to sin we can get. It's to see how far away from that line we can get. Proverbs, I believe it's 22, verse 3, says, The prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. 
And so we need to be wise, circumspect, prudent, cautious individuals who stay clear from sin in our lives and have a zero tolerance policy for sin for ourselves. I agree with the mathematics of one person uh, who wrote, sin adds to your troubles, subtracts from your joy, multiplies your difficulties, divides your interest in your work, and its wages are death. That's what I call good, sound, biblical mathematics. We need to be warned that there are consequences to sin. There's just no getting around sin's consequences. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Don't be mocked. God is not mocked. There's a principle of sowing and reaping in the spiritual arena, just like there is when it comes to the principle of cause and effect in other areas of life. Once again, you may be thinking, you know, Jeff, I'm, I'm, I'm still not quite there. I, I have this, this area of sin. I know it's there. I know it's there. And I, I just, uh, I, I don't want to let it go. No one has seen me. I haven't been caught yet. Okay, well, let me remind you of the consequences of sin if it's tolerated in your life. What are some of the consequences that you can face? Let me give you a laundry list of things. One of them is fractured fellowship with God. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. In a second, Adam and Eve lost the fellowship that they were privileged to have before the fall. The prodigal son, he experienced a fractured fellowship with his father. Uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 10 and following. That's one. So your relationship with God becomes negatively impacted. If you're a true believer in the Lord, you will also experience a loss of joy. If you entertain sin in your life, you yourself will be emotionally impacted. There will be a visceral reaction on your part, Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, as well as this text. Later we're going to see how David says, Return to me the joy of my salvation. I used to have it, it's gone now. Fractured fellowship with God, the loss of joy, also loss of rewards. That's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, it says, Therefore we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so there's potentially a loss of reward. What else? What's another consequence? Well, there's also the potential, based on Matthew chapter 18, the four steps of church discipline, of experiencing church disassociation. Matthew 18, verse 17, where you were considered a tax gatherer, a publican, uh, an unbeliever. You're put out of the church. That's pretty serious. And then also there is the potential for direct chastisement from God, where God himself will spank you. He'll come along and... and, and I'm not saying he's going to clock you, but he's, he's going to chastise you. The Lord disciplines those whom he loves, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. Fractured fellowship with God, loss of joy, loss of rewards, church disassociation, chastisement. Also, there is sickness, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. Uh, the Corinthians were partaking of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, and some of them were sick. We don't know what their sickness was but it probably didn't feel very good. And then in addition to sickness, there is ultimately the uh, possibility of death itself, where God takes a person out. That person sins a sin leading to death. Once again, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, with Ananias and Sapphira, and then also the sin that leads to death, referenced in 1 John 5, verse 16. 
All of those are potential consequences. If you say, hey, it's okay, I can live my life on my terms, I can do whatever I want, even as a believer, and not worry about the consequences. No. Uh, we need to take God and his word seriously. If you have never come to a point in your life where you have invited Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior and Lord, I want you to know that you are like the animal trainer. You are so susceptible, you are so vulnerable to leaving this life unprotected and having the sinful squeeze, the coils of sin, choke out your life. And if things don't change in this life, then there will be a spiritual, squeezing, crushing experience throughout all of eternity. If you do nothing else with Jesus before you leave this life, you will be systematically crushed, devastated, ruined throughout all eternity. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus says, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. God did not prepare hell for people. He prepared it for Satan, for his minions. But people who choose to follow in Satan's rebellion by rejecting Jesus, Jesus will say, I have no recourse but to give you what you wanted. Separation from me. But because your sin is against an infinitely holy God, you will experience infant punishment. And we don't want that for you. We don't want that for anyone here. The good news is that if you have been ensnarled, if you have been systematically squeezed by the crushing impact of sin, Jesus can unravel you. He can take away those coils. He's done all the work. You don't, you don't have to do anything to get right with him in the sense of trying to be a good person. He's done all the work. And what he did on Calvary's cross was perfect. There's the importance of repenting with a willingness to turn away from your sins and to trust Christ. But you can't add to the sufficient work of Jesus on the cross. He's done it all. We can't add to it. And so let me plea with you. Now is the time, now is the time to accept Jesus, if you've never done that before, to come to Christ. He can unravel you. And I don't uh, mean to scare you, but you really, you have one of two choices. Either, there's only two ways you can meet Jesus. One day you will meet Jesus. I don't care who you are today, you will meet him. You will either meet him as your savior, gladly, joyfully, or you will meet him as your judge. But you will meet him. Your relationship to him will look different based upon what your relationship with him was like in this life. And this message of repentance, getting right with God, uh, is the message, I believe, the crucial message in a nutshell which needs to be proclaimed far and wide in this day and age. People are wondering, what is God doing today? There's one verse that very clearly makes it abundantly clear what God wants to be communicated today. More important than anything else, I believe it's this one verse, Acts 17.30. It says, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. Why? Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. This is the message that needs to be proclaimed. God is now, in this day and age, proclaiming that people need to repent. They need to get right with God. They need to stop going uh, in their own direction and follow the direction that God has for them. So one day, Jesus will ultimately judge the world and the souls in it. And I would like to wrap this up by just mentioning how Jesus says, not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. John 5, verse 22. 
Also in John 5, 27, Jesus says, He that is the Father gave him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So instead of meeting Jesus later on as your judge, I plea with you to get right with Jesus today, right now, if you've never done that before. Come to Christ. Repent of your sins. Believe in Jesus Get right with God. Simply tell him that you have violated his holy law, that you have defied him, you've rebelled against his holy person, and receive him. Don't leave today without doing business with the Savior. This is an urgent message for you if you've never come to Christ. It's an urgent message for people in our lives, those who we meet on a regular basis. Well, uh, we... I've given a lot of thought to this one verse. Uh, I'm sure there's something that resonated with you. Uh, let's uh, take a few moments right now to come quietly before the Lord in a spirit of self-examination, self-introspection, dealing with sin in our lives, recognizing that our sin is a violation that is directed against God himself.